Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl Bondi Blue and I am back for another 911 review, y'all. All right, so the episode started off with a bowling alley. Yes, a bowling alley full of crunchy, dirty little teenagers that are trying to have a good time. The owner, Arlene, has to go and fix a stuck pin on aisle five. All right, there is a jerk that isn't doing his job, isn't paying attention, and is on his phone the entire time. So I guess he missed this part of the conversation when he was told not to let anybody play on lane five because she had to go and fix a pin. So she goes back there to fix a pin. Somebody starts playing on lane five because the jerk wasn't paying attention. So the lady's arm ends up getting crushed in the pin setter. Garrett, the new kid, calls the ambulance and gives them all of the information that they need once they get on the scene. I was like, all right, look at you. Look at you telling them everything they needed to know. All right. Now, if they opened up the pin setter and let her arm out, she would probably bleed out. So instead, Buck has the idea to cut the pin setter with her arm around it and take her to the hospital where they can, you know, have a better chance of saving her life once they get her arm out of that pin setter. It looked very painful. I mean, it crushed her arm. It was terrible. And we just knew something was going to happen. Like I was watching like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The kid Garrett who gave the crew all the information that they needed to know and help them get the pin setter to open up. Okay. He was very helpful. And as they were wheeling Arlene out to put her on the ambulance, Garrett is right by her side. And he says, don't worry. He already gave all of the customers a coupon to come back for the next time instead of giving them their money back like she suggested and then she named him manager once she realized he basically had everything under control and the first thing he did was fire the guy who was on his phone and wasn't paying attention to aisle five where no one should have been playing then we see Henrietta stop by Michael's place to bring him some special tea that will help with his nauseousness because he's taking the uh, chemo pills currently and it'll help them work better, things of that nature. He's going on this yearly camping trip with Harry that he goes on every year. It's a tradition in his family. His father used to take him and they would plant a tree. And so now they're going this year and he's supposed to be planting a tree with Harry, but he's sick. He has this brain tumor. He's weak. He's tired and everybody is worried about him they are not okay with him and Harry going on this trip but he's trying to make sure that Harry has this last trip with him just in case it is the last one so Bobby is going along with them and even though he's a paramedic it's still not going to help if something really happens and they're in the middle of the woods but Michael is not taking no for an answer May tells Athena and Bobby she feels like it's her fault because she told him he had options and now he's not getting the surgery and it's a possibility that he can just be you know, basically wasting away as they speak. And it's all because of something that she told him that he decided to change his mind. Athena tells her that she's not the one that told him not to get the surgery. So don't blame herself. But she still is worried. And she just found out she got into USC and she didn't even care about that because she's worried about her dad and feeling guilty about it. So this is already taking a toll on their family. And it seems as if Michael is trying to act as if nothing is going on or nothing is changing and everything is changing. While Bobby, Michael, and Harry ride in the car on their way up to the camping site, Michael tells Bobby about how it's a tradition in their family and how they go and, you know, find a great spot and they plant a tree. And because his dad died before Harry was born, it's something that he does to keep his father alive and his grandson, whom he's never met. While he's talking about all of this, he starts to get some pain in his arm. So he pulls over on the side of the road and lets Bobby take over driving. And Harry is sitting in the back seat, eyes open, ears open, definitely paying attention to the fact that his dad is not feeling well and things are happening much faster than he was told they would happen. When they get to the campsite, they start to put the tent up and right before they go to look for the perfect spot, which they usually do as soon as they get there because it takes a while, Michael is too tired and just wants them to give him an hour so he can rest and then they can go and look for a spot. Harry wasn't taking it well and Bobby decided, why don't we go and look at a few spots, take some pictures and bring it back to your dad so that y'all can just go out to the three main spots and pick one of those spots. Bobby's just trying to help. But when they get back 
after looking at the three spots, Michael is pissed because they went off without him. And it was something that they were supposed to do together. Harry is trying to explain to him that they were only going to, you know, pick three spots to show to him. He wasn't trying to hear that because he feels like Bobby went off and did it. And this is the last time they might be able to do it. So he wants to be there for everything that they normally do. Harry says, I just want to go home. At this point, it kind of feels like the trip is ruined and Michael is upset and Bobby is walking on eggshells, not knowing exactly what he should be doing, but he at least needs to be honest with him. He tells him, you can't keep acting like nothing is happening. You are definitely not feeling well. And I think it's time for us to tell the truth about that. Harry is not blind and we're not pulling a wool over his eyes by denying the fact that you can't do the things that you would normally do. Bobby says to Michael, Michael, did you even know that May got into USC? I watched all the joy get drained out of her face when she found out you were going on this camping trip because she's so worried about you. Michael says that he is just trying to step back a bit and it feels like he's pushing everybody away, but he wants them to learn how to be a family without him because he feels like this might be the end which is so sad and even more so makes you feel like he should just get the surgery. If you're already going to be living your life like you plan to die, you might as well go ahead and get the surgery and give yourself a better chance because you can't tell Michael the best way to handle his tumor. You know what I'm saying? You can't tell him the best way to handle it. But at the same time, sitting there taking chemo pills and getting sicker and sicker feels like, you know, like you're waiting to die. It feels like you're waiting to die. Later on, he apologizes to Bobby and he explains that the reason why he wanted Bobby to come is because he wants Bobby to be there to keep him and Michael's father alive for Harry once he's gone. May is all grown up and she has had him for most of her life, but Harry is still a kid and he's going to need somebody to be there for him. And he asked Bobby to be that person. And they're both sitting there with tears in their eyes, y'all. It was such a beautiful moment because Bobby was like, I will do that. And when you think about everything that Bobby's lost, I don't know if you know it, you've been watching this whole time, but most of us who have been watching the whole time know that Bobby lost his entire family due to his alcohol problem. He fell asleep and left, um, what was it, like a, a hot plate, a heater. He left a heater on in the basement of his home with his uh, wife and his kids and he wasn't there, ended up, ended up setting on fire and killing everybody in the house. So he definitely feels guilty and there is a hole and he has love to give to children. So having Athena's kids there and having Harry there for him to be a father to, I'm sure means so much to him. So to actually be asked to take that position in, in somebody's life by the father, I'm sure that meant so much to him. You know what I'm saying? Just such a great emotional moment. Athena and May back at home decide to have a day of shopping because Athena wants May to go to USC and she wants her to be excited about it. She went to USC and she wants her daughter to follow in her footsteps but right now May is just kind of feeling down about everything that's going on with Michael. Child I understand child lord knows I do. Y'all know my dad got cancer um right in my junior year of college I believe it was my sophomore or junior he got it before then and it was kind of this long process he did chemo he had his lung removed and we thought everything was fine and he had a pin sized incision in his lung and ended up getting pneumonia and was put into a medically induced coma and never came out of it. And I had to go and take finals the same week as his funeral. So I understand. I totally understand, you know, the, the situation that May is in at this age and what that's like to have a parent who may not be there soon. You know what I'm saying? Like, or to go through that, you know, all in all, it's just a lot. Athena has a drink with Henrietta and talks to her about how she's feeling. She feels like Michael needs to have the surgery and that he's being a fool, not listening to her. But Hen reminds her that she can't tell him how to handle his tumor. Athena says she doesn't know how she's going to be able to deal with her kids not having their father around. What that is going to do to them. And Henrietta tells her that this is not the first time those kids have had to prepare for the loss of a parent. I'm sure there have been plenty of times that Michael has had to prepare them for the possibility of you not coming home. Athena seems to think that's this far away possibility, but it's actually not. Like people get killed, you know, in a 
the line of fire or on duty all the time. Foolishness. Like you think that them pulling people over to give tickets would be something safe, but then you pull somebody over, they pull down the window and shoot you and you're gone. You know what I'm saying? So it's not safe. It's never like safe. You're always scared that someone who works in the line of duty in that way may not make it home. So I think she was being unrealistic about the similarities. But either way, Hen impresses on her to think about the fact that her children will be fine. Children are resilient and eventually it will become a part of who they are and it will either drive them to be better or it will harm them. Either way, you are there to help them through it and that's all you really can pray and hope for. Me personally, it was hard, but... By the time I, I dealt with what was going on, I was grown. You know what I'm saying? Like me and my mom talk to each other about my dad all the time. I have reminders around my house of him. I keep him alive in that way. Whenever I cook meals that he taught me how to cook or that he would cook really well, you know, I always get into the frame of mind of who he is. I know my kids will know who he is because they will grow up being surrounded by, you know, memories of him. So I understand what Henrietta was trying to make Athena understand is that eventually they'll be okay anyway, which is very true. I mean, I'm all right. You be all right. You know, it stays with you, but you be all right. I mean, I just kind of feel like at the end of the day, our parents are going to die before us. That's the way it's supposed to go. And it's always hard. It doesn't matter what the circumstances. It's always hard. It doesn't matter if they died at 40, if they died at 50, if they died at 60, 70. It doesn't matter. I feel like it's always hard. But I also feel like it is life and we have to learn how to deal with death without thinking about it as some you know, moment that will stay with us no matter what it does, but not like that. Life goes on. Like, you know, death should not break a person is what I'm saying. Death should not ruin your life. Okay. And I'm just saying that because it is an inevitable, like it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So you shouldn't let something that you know is going to happen eventually ruin your life forever you know what i'm saying so y'all we get to chimney this episode chimney is getting up in the middle of the night to get himself some water and finds his brother albert and some girl some beautiful girl that he is taking home from the club okay and they were calling her a rando club girl and she went into the bathroom to get dressed and when she came back out because she overheard them she let them know that she was a phd in applied mathematics okay and i'm like uh ma'am you can be as book smart as you want to be you still went home with somebody that you met at the club that night so yeah if you end up being made to feel cheap because you on somebody else's couch that's your own damn fault and that don't make you that smart that ain't got nothing to do with applied mathematics that you couldn't apply common sense to you not going home with somebody you just met i know that stuff that people do but i don't think that's safe like i just don't think it's safe to go home with somebody you just met that night you never know what people will do to you and it's great that every once in a while it ends up with just a hot night of sex and that's all but sometimes it ends in a whole bunch of other messed up ways like being tied up in a basement or something like that you know I know that's you and far in between but you'll be happy I gave you this advice if that never happens to you <laughs> like I'm just saying don't don't do that like get their phone number and hook up with them once you didn't learn where they live at where they work at you know what I'm saying like don't be going home with people you don't know uh-uh mm -mm. they got way too many damn episodes of SVU <laughs> that you can apply to this scenario for y'all not to listen to me. That's all I got to say. But either way, Albert brings it to Chimney's attention that he needs passion in his life and he doesn't see any passion between Maddie and Chimney. And I'm like, well, that is kind of true. But so much has happened in their relationship. There has to be some love there. There has to be some passion there. I just think both of them are reserved personalities and also people that like to take things easy. You know what I'm saying? So I understand why there hasn't been a lot of fiery passion. It's because people have died. People have gotten stabbed, okay? Chimney and Maddie have been through things, you know? But this does stay in the back of Chimney's mind. He talks to Henrietta and Eddie about it and they co-sign that things are moving really slow in this relationship, understandably, but still, Eddie tells him he should tell Maddie he loves her if that's how he feels about her. Like, tell her before it's too late. So, y'all, then we see a young woman and her dad uh, trying to put up a wall in her apartment. Now, it's supposed to be an open floor plan, but she says she needs a wall to hide some of her mess. So, they're building a wall. Now, they told 
her mom that they would be careful. So she's supposed to use the gloves and the glasses and all of that. And then they use the nail gun and they're putting the wall together. And the nail gun gets jammed. So the dad turns the gun around and does exactly what he told his daughter not to do and faces the nail gun towards himself to see why it's jammed and ends up shooting himself in the chest with the nail. Yeah. And you just knew it was going to happen. I mean, I was on the edge of my seat this entire scene. As soon as I saw the nail gun, I got scared because I didn't know where it would go. And it went right in his heart, y'all. It went right in his heart. So the crew gets there and the nail is sticking out of his chest and it's creating fluid on his heart. When they get into the ambulance, his heart stops and they have to do chest compressions, which causes blood to spread squirt out everywhere like all over everybody all in chimney eye it was everywhere it was all over Henrietta's glasses Ugh. but they got him to the hospital he was alive his heart was a ticking so they just got to get the nail out of there and hopefully everything will be okay that mama is not gonna let him live that down not at all so Chimney asks Maddie out to have a really nice dinner and she's freaking out about it to Jason who is still kind of going through it. Y'all know he got beat up by that guy who robbed him and pretended to like him on a dating app and ended up, you know, beating him up and taking his money and stuff. That was terrible. So he's still going through that and he's kind of, you know, thinking he's seeing the guy outside of his work and everything. And I'm like, dude, if you thinking you seeing him, you might actually be seeing him. That was my first thought when he told that to Maddie. Maddie says that she went through a similar skittish phase herself so that's what they chuck it up to a skittish phase maddie and chimney get to the dinner and they go to this really dope restaurant that is like rotating so you get to see the entire view while you're having dinner chimney tells maddie that he loves her and you know there's a question of does she love him and she explains to him that she does feel that way but when she was in the abusive relationship with her dead husband, saying I love you was an immediate response to stay safe because she was scared of him. No, it's I love you, you know. So she hasn't said it in a while because before saying I love you was something she did out of fear instead of out of love. But she does feel that way about him and she feels a whole bunch of other ways about him. And you can see his face light up as she was saying that to him. It was like, oh. And then somebody starts to have a proposal moment behind them. And she's like, oh my God, please don't ever propose to me in public. It makes me squirm, okay? And then everybody starts paying attention to this couple. And the guy realizes that everybody is watching him. He has his box in his hand. His girlfriend is like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> you know, and they're rotating. And he starts to hold the box really tight. And she snatches it out of his hand, but it falls on the floor. They both get under the table to try to find it. And I thought he was going to try to tell her why they were under the table that he wasn't about to propose to her but he didn't he should have it would have saved her some embarrassment but either way she finds the box opens it it's some beautiful diamond earrings and she gets upset she's like after five years earrings i should have left you three years ago <laughs> and then as she gets up to storm off from the table the table pins her against the wall because y'all remember it's rotating so now she's stuck and it cracks her pelvic y'all it So she's stuck standing there. And of course, Chimney and Maddie have to jump into action as a paramedic and a former nurse. Chimney has to break the bolted table from the ground to get the table out of the way. Chimney gets her down to the floor. He checks her pelvis and it is cracked. So they have to go and call the ambulance. Chimney asks Larry, the boyfriend, to switch places with him while they lift her up to put something up behind her back. And he says that the only reason he didn't propose was because he was scared that she wasn't going to say yes. But she did say yes. And she says, but you didn't ask. And he says, well, will you marry me? And she says, yes. So it ended up being a proposal anyway with earrings instead of a ring. But I'm sure they'll get a ring and she can pick out her own ring, which is sometimes better. But either way, Larry got the girl at the end, even if she did have a broken pelvis. And because it was at a beautiful hotel and Chimney and Maddie ended up saving the day, the hotel offered them this beautiful suite and they go up there to the suite and have Mr. and Mrs. Nasty time, even though they're not Mr. and Mrs., but you know, Mr. and Miss Nasty time, yeah. <laughs> Child, I was here for it. And when Chimney went home all early in the morning and Albert was worried, he was like, don't worry about me, things ignited, okay? He was sexy too. I was like, all right, Chimney. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, Maddie gets back to work the next day 
okay, at the 911 call center. Josh comes over to her, and then their boss comes up to them, and it's the guy. I thought it was a dream, y'all. I didn't know what was going on for like like four or five seconds. I didn't know what was happening, but the guy who beat up and robbed Josh shows up to the 911 call center with his other criminal buddy with guns to hold up the 911 call center, and I'm like, but why though? Like, what are you getting out of this? You had gotten away with what you did. So why are you now holding everyone at the 911 call center hostage? How does that make sense? I cannot wait until these two weeks are over so I can find out what the hell is going on and why you do this. This is stupid. You know, like, oh my God, like what in the meth? But you know what? It's going to be good. And I hope you guys come back. I hope you guys enjoyed the review. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you have not more ready. I love y'all. See y'all in the next one.